What's up dudes, Dude Dads, Brad the Guitar just here. Uh, in this video we're going to open this up and fix whatever's in it. I believe this is a 1960s Gibson Titan amplifier. We'll go ahead and speed it up and get this thing out of here for you. Uh, it's got some wire in here. I'm not sure what's up with the wire. I'll have to consult his notes, I suppose. Let's go ahead and read that, I guess. I picked up this amp from an estate sale in Shreveport, Louisiana. The amp was owned by the principal of a local high school who also sponsored the electronics club. This amp was one of their projects and he passed away before it was finished. Uh oh, so I don't know what all was done then. So that could be interesting. After I bought it, the amp was worked on by a local tech who, like many in the tech community, is getting up there in age. He is a Fender Marshall guy and really dislikes working on anything else. I, you find that a lot. He got the amp working but kind of limping along, I think, because his heart wasn't in it. The amp was spectacular, but the tone controls did not respond normally, especially the bass control. The rotary power switch was bad and he could not source uh, a same for same. So the amp no longer has standby. You don't need it anyway. The amp worked for a few months and then after not playing it for several more months it powered up and did not have sound. So I did some resistance testing on the output transformer. The reading seemed odd so I swapped it out for a known, uh oh, here we go, for a known good output transformer and it did not resolve the no sound situation. That explains why the OT leads are clipped. So is the output transformer out of the amp now? Okay, so what we have here is, is potentially a basket case then, is, is what it sounds like to me, that we're going to have to resurrect and then, and then try to make as ideal as possible. So this is going to be a fun one then. Okay, wish list. <clears throat> you know you're in for it usually when there's a wish list involved. Restore sound and stabilize functionality. That goes without saying. Restore normalcy to the tone controls. Do your thing, make it sound good. I trust you. My only ask is that any mods be non-destructive to the chassis. Using existing holes, uh, double check the tremolo for functionality. Restore the standby function, not a high priority. Okay, well that's good because I probably won't want to do that. Okay, see so he also indicates here that he's a classic rock guy and he likes heavy stuff. Uh, I've enclosed a goodie bag for you and hope you find the items useful. Not sure what's. I'm not sure if this is part of the goodies or if this is wiring you want me to use. Uh, goodie bag. Let's see what's in the goodie bag here. Okay, cool. We've got some. Uh, got a bag full of capacitors in here. Some of those will come in handy in some projects. That's real cool. And all right, we've got some fuses. Definitely, those will come in handy for sure. Uh, I've been running low on fuses anyway. I was going to have to buy some. There's uh, another capacitor I can put with my capacitor stash. More capacitors. Some resistors in there too. More, uh, let's see, what, what are these? I think those are, I think those are two. Two amp. There's some more capacitors. Some orange drops. I can definitely use those. Thanks, man. I appreciate that, Gary. That's good of you, man. And what we got here, more goodie bag stuff, I guess? Yeah, this must be what it is. There's lots of capacitors. There's also, uh, there's some larger resistors here. Those could be used in like dropping power down if you're doing modifications on a power supply, things like that. Very cool, dude. I appreciate that a whole lot. Here's some older stuff. Looks like new old stock stuff. A couple West German capacitors. Those probably, and some knobs, some Marshall knobs. Very cool, man. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Oh, and some dual game pots. I probably could have just used those in the uh, project I just did. But, uh, see what we have here. This is uh, something wrapped up here. Looks like maybe it's part of the chassis. I don't, I don't know. What the hell is this? I guess maybe that will become apparent in a little bit. There's some kind of pieces of chassis or shielding or something there. Um, I've also got some big long terminal strips here. I'm guessing once again those are part of the grab bag thing. We've got some uh, solder iron tip cleaners there. Get this bad boy out and get it up on the bench and then we'll get a little closer look at it. 
Okay, here we are with this Gibson amp up on the bench. We can get a little better look at it. You can see it's a two channel. Here's one channel over on this side. We've got a loudness control, a bass control, mid-range control. The mid-range control is doing some wiggling around, so I'm not sure what's up with that. Maybe it just needs to be tightened. Treble control here. Um, and you know, he said there were some problems with the EQ, so we're gonna have to get a closer look at what all was changed on the EQ. I would say probably if somebody was using this in a classroom setting, they probably swapped out the EQ entirely just to demonstrate how different EQs work. And they probably, my guess is if you were doing that in a classroom, you would probably want to change one side to something different than the other side and then you would be able to you know demonstrate the differences between the two but that's probably what i would want to do if i was teaching it gibson logo still looks good all of the uh graphics and stuff on it still look pretty good a little bit of uh pitting over here and corrosion it's not bad that would probably come off with a little bit of steel wool there's not very much of it you see the little metalist uh, badge right there and that has the little coat of arms with the duck on it apparently uh, that is the Gibson coat of arms I think the medalist series he said to, according to his research it was 1964 I would have assumed slightly later than that but he uh, I, I'll take his word for it for the time being pretty much same thing on this side we've got a loudness bass mid-range and treble I did notice again on this side mid-range is really loose the bass control is really loose and the tri and the loudness control is really loose those don't seem loose so that doesn't seem like a problem do have the little gibson electronics division of gibson incorporated kalamazoo down there written so all of that writing is still on there and for those of you who are counting as far as uh serial numbers go there's the serial number for this one 702872 and as he pointed out, there weren't very many of these made. Uh, I, th I think I have a video showing one of these on the channel a long time ago, like years and years ago. And if I find it, I'll put a link to it up here so you can go check that out. Um, but let's uh, flop this thing around. We'll pull the tubes out, populate it with tubes. Well, maybe not populate it yet with tubes because we'll have to hook up that output transformer before we can even test it. So. I would like to see what it's doing and what kind of sounds it's making, but without hooking up an output transformer, we'll be dead in the water. So that'll be the first thing that we do probably. Okay, so here's the rear of this thing. We've got a speaker jack and a foot switch jack, quarter inch, that have been installed. Something came out of here before. I'm not sure what that would have been if it probably speaker wires that would have come out and then gone down inside of the cabinet. I think the backs on these cabinets, because they were supposed to be made for bass, not guitar, if I recall correctly. So they were sealed back cabinets on these. Three amp fuse, convenience outlet. It's funny they had to label that convenience outlet, just in case somebody was confused. Sorry for the convenience. <laughs> We've got a very big power transformer over here and we've got a very comparatively sizable output transformer over here on this side actually those are almost the same size transformers really by the look of it probably pretty pretty well balanced when you're lifting the thing but still going to be heavy okay tf-302-h 156 will be the manufacturer of this transformer right here uh, 529 so this would be the 29th week of 1965 on that transformer so it can't be any earlier than that that's what I would have thought that's you know that it would have been slightly later 65 it's probably a 66 amplifier would be would have been my guess but that would put it right at the tail end of kind of the, the Crestline series I am pretty sure we'll try to get a number off of this with what little light we have over here on this side of the room sorry about that okay tf what does that say 135-4 maybe and then we have uh, 1097 that will be the manufacturer and then we have 64 that's 1964 the 22nd week so this transformer is 
1964. The output transformer, it, it looks like it's installed with the information where we're not going to be able to see it, but I'm curious because he said that there was a change in the output transformer and the leads have all been clipped. I'm just kind of wondering. I would like to make sure it's the original one. Yeah, it's got a it's got a TF model number like the other ones do, so my guess is that's probably the original transformer, like he said, that has been put back in. That's a 606. That's a Schumacher transformer. 430. So that's 1964, 30th week, and that's a Schumacher made output transformer. It doesn't necessarily surprise me that the numbers that the manufacturer would be different on the output as on the power uh, and this other transformer over here as well which i assume is a choke it's got to be the choke yeah i don't see any other wires i only see two wires going to it so yeah that would be the choke there uh yeah let's flip it and start working on the output transformer we know it's going to have to be hooked up anyway regardless of what else we do so that seems like a sensible place to start and we'll do it without putting in any tubes because that way we'll be able to just lean it back without worrying about crushing the tubes. Let me figure out where everything should go here. I'll splice in some uh, longer wires to go where we need to go with it. But actually, you know what, now that we're uh, in here, it might be a good idea to just look at what we've got. There's definitely been some pots changed. Like that one is an alpha pot. It's certainly not original. All of these should have been like more like CTS pots. Um, can I find even a single original pot in here? Possibly. But that one's certainly not. At least I don't think it is. And then this one over here is not. What is that? I don't think that's an original pot either. And you can see just, I mean, this is going to be, this is going to be a fun one, right? I'm going to have to trace out all this crap. Somebody else's project is never fun. I usually I turn this stuff down. I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, no no offense, Gary, but <laughs> you've, uh, uh, you're, you're going to be getting some work that normally I would not have accepted. Too many mods, too many uncertainties of what someone else has done. The caps have all been done, which is nice on the one hand, but on the other hand, you don't know if they're in the right place. You don't know if they have the right polarity. Usually not a good starting position, you know, if you're wanting to do this kind of work. But they all are good caps, you know, they're, they're all F and T's and they, you know, like this one though, for instance, look, look at this one. It's coming loose. So we're probably gonna wanna put some silicone or something, something to, to marry it a little bit better to that holder. Cause that was popped out to the point where it was actually shorted on this. Either I'll squirt some silicone in here to kind of marry these parts together, or I'll have to do something. I mean, obviously. So we'll figure that part out when we come to it. But you see here, they put a little bit of silicone here and it's kind of, kind of grabbing onto this and the capacitor so they can't move around. I'm going to probably add some more to that and just do the same everywhere else too. Um, now, some of these orange drops, possibly even all of them, could be original. I do know that uh, Gibson was using this style of orange capacitor at around this time, so these, these are likely original. These red ones are not. I don't know what all this is out here built up. You see all this stuff floating out here? I mean, that's a mess. Jeez, I mean, that's probably some kind of tone network, but why it would be built out like this, I don't know. You know, again, he said that this was being used as some kind of probably lab experiment in a high school or something, and uh, so it's possible they were just messing with some different tone networks here. We will probably take out all of this. Oh, look at that. That just came right loose. Look at that. I just hit that and it came loose. It looked like it was hooked around back there, but it's it's loose. There was no solder on it at all. Uh, we've got another one over here. Look at this. All of that stuff is probably just going to come out I, and start from scratch. You know, I would almost rather just this thing be blank <laughs> than, than have all of this stuff in it. So that's probably what I'll do. We'll design some kind of circuit that uses bass, treble, and mid-range and a volume control. We'll, we'll just completely redesign that whole part of the circuit. This looks like it is a roach for, a, for his tremolo right here. 
So this has a, a light dependent resistor set up that it uses for the tremolo. We'll look at the schematic for it first of all. Let's just go ahead and dig up a schematic. And I guess we'll start just disassembling stuff on the front panel and then uh, reassembling stuff on the back panel. This is gonna be a lot of work. And I'm not saying this to sound like I'm bitching or anything, cause I'm not, it's just, it is what it is. I've gotta do the work. But uh, it's a lot more than it sounds like when you put it on paper, because you would think that all this, most of this stuff would already be hooked up and ready to go. I just gotta troubleshoot it. Well, no, that's not the case at all, because we've got the output transformer completely disconnected. We gotta reconnect it. That's not a huge deal. But all this stuff up here, I have no idea what it is. We're gonna have to redesign the circuits for each of these sides. We may even maybe do one side that's more fendery maybe, and one side that's more martially. I would say the side that's more martially, we'd wanna put on the side without the tremolo. Um, it's also possible we might be able to, if the tremolo only works on one side, we may be able to make it, um, wire it in such a way so that it's more universal for both sides. We'll, we'll see what we can do with that. We just gotta look at the schematic at this point and start thinking about this. All right, so here is the schematic for this thing. Uh, and it's so big, the schematic is, that it spans over two different pages. Uh, but we'll take a, just a brief look at it here. Um, this is the output section. You can see with the power tubes here. Um, this is a voltage regulator. This is V4. This thing has a voltage regulator tube in it. That, that's that OA2 tube right there. I've got a whole bunch of those voltage regulator tubes. I'm not even sure what to do with. I've got so many. It's uh, I don't think I'll ever use them in 10 lifetimes. Um, I'm not sure if I have the OA2 or not. I think I've got a bunch of those too. At any rate, um, fairly standard here. It does not have, apparently, you can look at the biasing here. Uh, if we look at the cathodes, the cathodes are just going straight to ground. And they're all tied together straight to ground. So this is not a um, cathode biased circuit on the output. Here's where the bias voltage orig originates from. I don't see an adjustable resistor listed on the schematic. There is an adjustable, you know, there's a pot right here. I don't know if it's for the bias or not. I presume it probably is. Yeah, hard to tell. Not sure on that. Um, where are we going here? We're going to... Uh, yeah, no. that's that, that has nothing to do with it. That's on V2, so that's going to be what? An internal pot connected to pin 8 of V2. So that would be a cathode of V2. So does that have something to do with the trim, maybe? That's V2A, so we're looking for V2B. I don't see V2B. Where the hell? Oh, there it is. We should see it coming off of V2B as adjustable, but I don't. I don't see that as adjustable. Huh. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Maybe that's an adjustable bias just for that half of V2, but why would they do that? That doesn't make a lot of sense now, does it? unless I'm just backwards on which one is V2. Uh, the 6EU7 has pins one and two as the filaments. And this one has, okay, four and five. So that is a 12AU. So that would be V6, not, not the other way around. So we're looking at pin eight on V6, which is gonna be on V6B. So where am I? Okay, B, V6B, yeah. This is, re okay, right there. It's absolutely related to the trim. Okay, so this is part of the trim circuit. And then we've got, I guess that's a light. I, guess they, I think that's supposed to mean a light right there. Um, we'll track all of that stuff down if we need to. I don't anticipate having to mess with the tremolo. He, he didn't say that the, there was a problem with the tremolo, but you can see, like I said, this spans over two pages. I might just cut this down and then stick these together in the correct spot so we can read it all at once, but um, you get the idea. So this line right here coming out of this tube, out of the plate, goes through 
this, which I, again, I assume is the light, and then you've got a, a light dependent resistor right there. Okay, so you got the light, and then you got the resistor here. Uh, and uh, this comes over here, and it's connected to this side, and that goes to that, uh, uh, that OA2 tube. So that is uh, a voltage regulator right there. And then what's kind of interesting too is that this circuit is tied in with the what looks like is that the grids? It's really hard to read. This is a hard schematic to read. Is I can't see shit on this really. That's tied in with the uh, screen grids right there. So that's different. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely different, but I don't know if it's different in a good way. Uh, I guess we'll just have to check it out maybe once we get it all going. But the, the first things first, I, I just want to get it going, and then we can worry about mods in a little bit. But, I mean, just from what I'm seeing here, um, this may be a good... Since we've got the two channels, we've got one channel here that has independent, completely independent tubes on the on the channel for the preamp okay so it's got its own preamp uh, the second channel has all of its own preamp as well down here so this might be a good situation to uh, and you can see the channel 2 is going to be lower output because it only has uh, one two gain stages whereas the uh, first channel up here has one two three gain stages looking to see here but I do not see we don't have any um, cathode followers in either one of these channels I might redesign channel one entirely um, and do this one like a kind of Marshall-esque you know and then make channel two more of a Fender-esque since it's cleaner anyway um, we might do the channel two uh, tone stack more Fender Fender esque, so you know you can get sort of a Fender twin kind of a tone out of this. Um, and then on the first channel, that one looks like it might be fairly ideal to try to do sort of something Marshally, uh, since at least we have three gain stages before well i say three but before they get mixed we have more than that actually uh, we have four we have v6a here but again i do know one thing for sure all of this crap has got to come out of here this is the way that this is all just kind of hanging in midair over here i mean hanging in midair is not uh, it's not terrible when it comes to some tone stack stuff but the thing is it's hanging in midair on all three sides you know, having some stuff that's anchored and comes out in midair and ties in is usually not that bad. But the way that this is, it's just, man, it's a mess. It really is. I don't know why they've used these metal type resistors uh, in a tone circuit. We're going to definitely do something about that. That's just not good. AC, AC, and then the positive. That is that a little diode, dual, dual diode thing? It is, isn't it? DI-57 by Simtech. That's got to be a little dual diode thing. Um, I'll test it and make sure, but that's probably what that is. Over here you've got... Uh, there, that would be the biasing diode probably right there. You know, the, the thing about these amps, man, you know, you, you take one of these in kind of at your own risk because it's going to cost you a lot in time, man, a lot in headaches. And, you know, I totally understand the people who don't want to look at this kind of stuff, you know, who want to stick to stuff that's common. Uh, Marshalls, Fenders, stuff like that. Uh, you could sit there and make your bread and butter on stuff like that and not have these kinds of headaches where you come have to come in and completely, you know, learn the layout to something that you've never seen before because I mean frankly 
you, when would you have seen it? There's only like 150 of these things from this this year in existence, and then they probably changed it completely over the next couple of years. You know, even if they did name it the same thing, so it's not like you're going to get the same thing every time even if you found more of these so it's just like you may only see one or two of these in your entire repair career and uh each time you're gonna have to relearn where everything is but we'll get there one more thing i did notice about this is that uh the v1 tube over here on this side has got jumpers between the plates and the grids and the uh, cathodes so this is run in parallel this first stage which is driving more signal into this tone stack right here that's right after that first stage five and six or six and seven four and nine right there those are jumpered i'm gonna have to undo all that in order to cascade those just like a marshal on that side and you know something the more i look at this the more i hate the way that they've got these electrolytics in here i mean these i don't know what else you could really do with with them um, unless you had a doghouse or something on the top and there's honestly a lot of space for a doghouse up here and in between the two rows of tubes especially right over in here you would be able to put a doghouse up on top pretty easily but i hate these right here man the way that these are on the back like this that with the clips i just see no reason whatsoever to have those there i'm gonna take these off of the clips instead of these sloppy ass cable runs running to and fro over here i'm gonna get him up off of here and just put him over here where he belongs and just kind of tuck him down something like this maybe and then same with this guy i'll find a good spot for him over here and tuck him down and then this guy too i'll tuck him down over here try to make him nice and straight if i can but it's just gonna get this stuff these cable runs out of the damn way. See how much cleaner that is back here? And if we remove these, I'm, then I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna remove these clips. There's, I see no need for the clips. But yeah, we're gonna do something to get those out of the way. I might even look, this is a long cable run for this guy too, coming from way over here. He might be able to stay. He's less in the way over here than, than he would be even over here. So I might leave these and leave these but these three have got to go from back here. That they're just they're just in the damn way. All right, well that took a little while to do, but I think it's definitely worth it. You can see uh, much, much easier now to get to all the output sockets. These are up kind of out of the way now, um, much more in line, much cleaner looking, and uh, definitely an improvement. Uh, I wish there was a way I could kind of straighten these up as well and get those and these down here maybe a little bit more in order but i mean it is if you compare this to what we had before this is a vast improvement i'm just going to take everything out of the front panels man i'm just going to get rid of all of it and start from a clean blank slate and uh just as if we're building this thing from scratch i think that's just going to be the most economical approach okay so back on the bench with this gibson i've got a whole bag full of casualties that have been taken out of this thing lots of pots uh all of the tone stack stuff i wanted to show you these pots that uh were the weirdos that i, I just had never seen before and indeed these are just some strange pots that uh, i don't think i have ever seen before they have um they have these strange kind of dome-shaped shafts on them here as well, split shafts. Not knurled, but split and dome-shaped on the top. Um, I've just never seen any pots quite like this. I don't see any uh, maker's mark on them really anywhere, but I do see a, some numbers. All of them have these different numbers uh, depending on the value and so forth. CF-98 on this one, DJ, and that is a... It looks like a 66, but it's not. It's a DJ uh, G6. So that's on that one right there. And then there's, uh, you know, there's several, there's several of them in here. 
uh, and they all, like I said, have. I'll just give you a couple of examples of the numbers that are on here, just because I have never seen them before. It'd just be nice to kind of document what they are. DJ, again, well, G6, that's the same one. Uh, here's one that's a little bit different. This one has, instead of a brass shaft, this has got more of a steel shaft on it. Uh, so this one says CF, CF19, DJ, D6. So I'm guessing that you know denotes the value of the pot and all that stuff, but yeah, like I said, just a weird pot. They've got uh, if if I had to guess, I would say these are maybe Japanese made, uh, and they're probably original to the amp. I mean, but being 19, what is this? 66, 65, or 66 on the amp? I don't know. I mean, they would almost have to be USA made, I would think, at that time, but perhaps not. Um, I mean, but the thing is, there were so many of these in this amp, and the one, and what I was finding is, th these corresponded to the correct values closer than the other ones. So I'm thinking that these were the original ones that came in this amp. I've never seen these before in a Gibson amp, and I've seen a lot of Gibson amps, so. It's possible that they aren't original, but then again, why would somebody go through and replace all of the pots to the same values of what the schematic calls for, you know, with this type of pot? It just doesn't make any sense. You see what I mean? So anyway, but that's that's this uh, casualty so far. These will not be used in the new designs for this thing. Um, because I'm doing a split kind of Marshall and Fender dual channel setup um, having to go through and find uh, all the pots i found some uh, nice made in the usa ohmites that i can use for the uh, 25ks i've got i have enough for those on hand already the only ones that i could use out of the ones that were already here are we do have a couple of uh one meg pots that we can use and they're of reasonable a reasonable quality. I think these are made in Japan, and they do have a stamp on them made in Japan over here on this side. So you know, and, but and they're reasonable quality, like I said. So those two I can use. Um, that's the only two out of the original pots. So we're gonna have to buy all new pots for this for the new design, and I'm gonna have to order some pots. So it's gonna take me a little bit for this stuff to come in. So I think while I'm waiting for parts to come in, uh, I'll probably set this down off of the the bench here and. Uh, Try to knock out maybe something simple, some little project that will uh, keep us in videos for the next week or so. Okay, looking a little bit later at my pot stash, I did find one that is like those others. And it this one is labeled on the other side. I don't know if you're going to be able to read it or not. It's labeled Central Lab right there. 1963, the 47th week. So that's that puts this one right in the same kind of time band. So they Central Lab was making pots like this with an open back, I guess, so you could spray cleaner in there easily. And actually, the more I think about it and the more I dig, I do notice that Central Lab back in the day, they had these uh, fast stash. So it's like a fast attach uh, front and back. So this one, this piece right here, this is brand new, new old stock. So this is the front part. Now this is without a shaft. So you would have to have a shaft that would go down through here and through the back. And you would take this label off. It even tells you right here, remove the label to attach a type KR line switch. So what they're talking about right there is like this type of line switch. So you would take something kind of like this. Now this is a CTS brand, so it probably isn't this probably isn't what goes on here, but you get the idea. This would attach to the back, and then this piece with the switch would protrude would protrude through the rear of this. There would be a hole here, just like you see on some of these other pots. Here's one, for instance, that is a different brand, but it has a big hole in it. And again, it's for a switch just like that. So you would put you would line this part of the switch up with the hole so that when you move this it switches and that's the reason for the holes 
in the pots that we see inside of this Gibson. Um, they just happen to have used pots that they might have even taken the switches off of. But this is a huge stash of uh, pots that I bought on eBay the other day. Man, and I'm really, really happy with this purchase. We've got tons of sealed back ohmites, uh, lots of really good values as well, like uh, half megs and one megs and 100, 100 ohms, 100K, all kinds of uh, stuff that I can use for sure. Like those pots right there are some of the best pots that were ever made right there. Those ohmites. I've got tons of Allen and Bradley in here also that I've pulled out. Uh, some of them are used, but lots of them are new old stock. I've got all these in boxes that are new old stock over here, and I've even got uh, half of a box still full over here that I haven't even gotten out. So, I mean, I've got, I've got a ton of these. I think I bought this whole set, uh, this whole lot of pots, this box, and then everything you see out on the desk right here. Uh, for like 60 bucks including and it came with this too this is kind of cool this is like a it's a little testing uh, set up for uh, a tube you could put uh, an octal tube in here and it gives you banana plug access to each one of the uh, terminals so you have easy access for that you can even panel mount this on, up on something if you want to use this as like a like a testing station pretty cool some really cool graphics on these these are from uh, like 1956 and they're uh, they're brand new old stock again some really good uh, half meg I mean that's 500k pot right there it's a long shaft like this but it's a solid shaft and you can cut it down to whatever length you want so uh, like I said these ohmites are some of the best in my opinion some of the best uh, ever made these are better than CTS pots in my opinion these sealed back ohmites these are fantastic. Allen and Bradley pots as well are really, really nice pots. Just extremely heavy duty. Probably will never wear out. You know, they can get gummed up. I've had some that have gotten gummed up on the shafts before, but you can always spray stuff in there to loosen that up, and that's about the only thing that can go wrong with them. But uh, lots and lots of stuff I can use here, man. And for 60 bucks, that was quite a steal. And actually, look at some of these hosses right here. Look at this big, giant thing. This is a Mallory L15 rheostat, just massive old hoss, like I said. And then I've got one here that's a tri gang. I guess that's also a Mallory T600M12, says on that one. This one had been used, I guess, but uh, this one looks like, well, maybe it had too. But. Massive tri gang rheostat. I've got look at this thing, it's a long shaft on that as well. And then this is brand new old stock, but look at how long this thing is. Here's a typical pot. <laughs> look at how long that shaft is on that. <laughs> and then it's got it's a dual gang, and then it's got a switch on the back of it. But ain't too goddamn buku. Clarostat. This one is from probably the early 60s. Most of these seem to date from the late 50s and early 60s, all these pots. And like I said, most of them are brand new. Some of them even new in the box. There's a one meg central lab with a long shaft on that one. Just lots of lots of good stuff there, man. Very good score. Okay. We're back with this thing and it's pretty much completely done with the exception of the presence control which I may have to scrap in lieu of a negative feedback control just kind of a universal negative feedback instead of presence because I'm not exactly sure how or where to tie it in because we have a cathodine phase inverter in this amp and most of the well all of the presence controls that I've ever seen uh, the fender style presence controls uh, have been with a long tail pair uh, phase inverter so might be a bit tricky to try to get something to do what a presence control does and tie it back in to a cathodine phase inverter I'm not even sure how I'm gonna do that I'm, I'm gonna give it some thought though if I don't end up doing this tell me down in the description what you would have done where where would you tie a presence control how would you mock it up with a cathodine phase inverter but at any rate we're to the point now where we're gonna fire it up 
uh, for the first time and see exactly what it does. Uh, I'm going to probe around and uh, do some signal tracing and figure out uh, what the signal looks like at kind of each stage along the way. We'll start over here on the Marshall East side and uh, take some readings with the scope at the same time that we're going through this. Got it hooked up to a dummy load back here. So you won't be able to really hear anything, but uh, we should be able to see it on the scope. We'll go ahead and fire up everything here. Let's get a signal injected. Again, we're injecting it into this side over here. We're gonna go ahead and uh, turn it on and we'll dial it up on the Variac here and monitor the voltages as we go. I want to dial it up slowly because, you know, this is a complete rebuild. So I've moved so many things around. There's always a po possibility that I've miswired something. Um, that does happen. Nobody's immune from that that I know of. And let's get you over here where you can see it. Right here, we're at 51 volts in. Uh, let's go ahead and monitor what we've got voltage-wise on the B plus here. Uh, we're at 192 volts. That's before the thermistor on the secondary. Uh, 192 and then right after the thermistor it should drop slightly. Yeah, 191 drops about a volt or so. Nothing of consequence really because it's already warmed up now. So let's monitor that voltage um, as we kind of dial it up here. It's not really ideal, but we're mainly concerned about what's going to show up on the scope anyway. So here's what we've got coming in right here. There we go. Pretty wave coming in, as we would expect. Uh, skip down here to the tube. And we got a pretty wave there. Coming out of that tube, we've got a bigger wave that I have to scale down to see, which we expect. That looks really good. Uh, then from there, it goes through. Uh, from there, it goes through this cap. over to this control and let's see on the other side of the control that control works as we can see right there so so go, so far so good um, coming out of that control we come back and we go in over here into this tube signal looks good uh, and I'm not used to these 6 eu 7s so I'm having to think about this every time. It's going to be kind of hard to see, but there's a tiny bit of distortion up here on this upper part of the wave. I don't know if that is related to the tube. So this is where I am in the circuit. So we've come in, we're good through all of this. We've gone through this uh, 0 0.022 capacitor to here, and the signal looks pretty good. On the other side of this little network with this 470 uh, ohm resistor, or K resistor, excuse me, and the uh, 470 uh, picofarad capacitor right here, on the other side of that, we've got a little tiny bit of clipping maybe up here. See how the wave looks really, really good down here. It looks pretty much perfect. But up here, we've got a bit of a smear on the upper half of the wave. I don't know why it would be happening on just one half of the wave certainly is uh, it's a it's a bit unexpected then we go to a resistor that i added because it i had assumed well i wanted it to be an input resistor for the next stage but the problem is you can see on this top of the wave it really starts to get a cut off after that see there right there really starts to get clipped um and then if we come out of that after the amplification stage, I have to reduce it actually by 10 to get it on the screen. Um, you can see it's flipped, so the distortion is now on the bottom, but it's severely clipped now. I'll show you where it is. So we're right now we're looking at, uh, here's the first couple stages, one and two on this tube. Then it jumps over to here, and this is where we are right now. Right here's the resistor in question. That's the 82K resistor right there. On this side of it, it looks pretty good. And uh, it has a little bit of distortion on the upper half of the wave. But on this 
side, it really starts to get pronounced after that resistor. But the introduction of the distortion seems to come right here at this point with these two components. But that is, that is something that is included in the Marshall design. So I'm not sure, not sure what I'm going to do about that, if anything. All right, I think the problem may have been that I made this a one meg resistor. This is a voltage divider right here, but I'm, I made this one a one meg instead of a 470K. So we have a 470K here and a 470K here. That's supposed to divide this in, in half. I think I want to make both of these into one megs. I want to experiment with that. I want to uh, try changing this R10 from a 470K to a one meg. Um, and then I may come back and remove this 82K input resistor into the next stage. I'll, let's um, maybe take that tack first. Okay, I've inserted a one meg resistor in that spot. I haven't even clipped the ends of the leads off yet. I've just tacked it in for the moment because I may end up pulling it back out of there. But I want to see how it responds when we fire this thing up now. Okay, so there's the wave right there uh, before the resistance that I just inserted. Here it is after, and you can see it's still clipped. Still clipped on that top edge. I think that actually just made it even more pronounced. And then on the other side of that, it's going to be really clipped, I'm sure. Let's diminish it. I don't know. Yeah, you see this, the clipping is pretty extreme right, right there now. I can actually get that to go away, though, by adjusting the, the gain pretty far down. It's clipping a bit more symmetrically though it looks like maybe it is definitely uh, more symmetrical on the clipping it's clipped but it's way more symmetrical than it was so I think I'll tell you what I want to do I want to bypass the input resistor into that next stage and I want to observe what that does so I think I might just clip around it use some bits of wire here and just clip around it there shouldn't be anything there anyway because it's going into the input so it's uh there should be nothing dc right there but i want to make sure it doesn't short so i'm going to push my leads all the way up here i'm just going to clip right around that and we'll see what kind of change happens to the to this waveform right here uh hopefully we can make that work Right. Okay. Very subtle change, almost non-existent really clipping around that input resistor. Watch the wave here as I disconnect this wire. So there it is connected. There it is disconnected. So that's with the input resistor, what you're seeing on the scope right there. That 82K into that stage. And here it is without it. Now there's going to be some added noise to that signal because of this long length of wire which you don't even really see. It doesn't really register on there but theoretically it should include some more noise but you can see it does change the wave but it does not significantly change it to the point where I think it's um, worthwhile to go back in and take it out of there now, and, and we can control the amount of clipping now and at least like I said it is somewhat more symmetrical it does clip on the bottom of the wave a little faster than on the top but that kind of gives you some asymmetrical clipping that might be desirable to some extent in a guitar signal bottom of the wave starts clipping right in right there the top of the wave doesn't start clipping until there but then eventually, they do look somewhat symmetrical. Symmetry isn't always desirable in a guitar amp. It's really more of a hi-fi situation where you want perfect symmetry. I don't think the input resistor is an issue. Uh, we may want to come back in and, and follow the Marshall design and replace both of those one megs though and see what that does to the wave. I, I know it's going to lessen the amount of gain. I think it might be worthwhile to leave it as is for now until we do our demo and then we might come back in and try to modify things a bit later but I think for the time being this this might be where we leave it 
let's go ahead and continue looking a little further downstream. So from there it goes, okay, it goes straight over to a cathode follower that pushes the uh, tone stack. So if we come out of here, this is the output to, of the tone stack, which goes to this point right here. So we'll be able to test what's coming out of the tone stack from this. And I don't know about that. See, if you push this thing into clipping with that early, crank it, um, getting a lot of clipping on the just the bottom edge of the wave only. It's really asymmetrical. Okay, see, it's I'm, this is turning the first um, the gain control, and right there it just flattens out on the bottom of the wave completely. Right there, boom, it just becomes flat, just chopped right off. Okay, so I've decided to go ahead and continue prodding around. Uh, downstream and I've gotten to past the phase inverter where you have this uh, 6FQ7 or 6CG7 basically the same tube but the originally the Titan was designed for a 6FQ7 but the thing is uh, going into the FQ7 we have a signal I'll show you of course we have the phase inverter splits the signal so we've got two halves we've got this half, which we can distinguish if we drive it a little bit here, and okay, you can see the top half is clipped off here. Uh, if I go to the other side, that's going to the other half of that tube. You should see the bottom will be clipped off right there. So that's all looks fairly correct um, into the tube, but coming out of the tube, I've got nothing. I've got nothing coming out of the tube, and. I think I might have figured out why. Um, a 6SFQ7 if we look at the um, if we look at the pinout for the 6FQ7 it is different from a 12AX7 only slightly. It has no connection on pin 9 whereas on a 12AX7 there is a connection on pin 9 for the heaters. It's a heater center tap. You see on uh, 12AX7 it's a center tap for the heaters. So you can use, you could run this as a 12 volt um, heater or you could cut that in half down to a 6 volt. Most people run these as 6 volt tubes, a 12AX7. A lot of people don't know that, but most of the time in, in guitar amps they're wired up as a 6 volt tube because that's the winding that is provided on uh, most amplifiers as a 6.3 volt filament winding but on the like I said on this one the FQ there's no connection here however in the actual amp we see right here here's pin 9 right here and it has black wires that are part of the filament circuit and then we've got these tied up over here just like a just like a 6 volt 12AX7 would be or you know 12 AU7 or whatever and but he provided me with a 6 FQ7 in the box and that's what's in here now I'm gonna replace that FQ7 with a 12 AX7 or AU or whatever and uh, see if it comes to life I have a suspicion it's probably going to Okay, I have filament glow in that 12AX7 now. And we'll see what that does. I have a suspicion. Oh, there we go. Now we've got something. There it is. Okay, so somebody had already re rewired that socket to accept a 12AX7, 12AU7, whatever, and the the FQ is no longer part of the circuit. So that wasn't my doing, but it's probably not a bad idea at the end of the day. Okay, 
I think our next step, well, now that we know the signal is coming out of the output, I, actually, I can actually hear it vibrating in the output transformer. Um, so we do have signal there. It's present. At least on that side it's present. Let's test the other side of the capacitor. And there it is on the other side of the capacitor going into the output tubes. Let's check the other uh, pair of output tubes and there that is. We notice the wave clipped up at the top on this side and it should be clipped at the bottom on the other side and it is. Um, if we want to really clip it up we can. But without biasing this thing first, I'm hesitant to uh, push it. Uh, even though I'm at 90, I'm only 98 volts on the input right now. But we do have output through that that channel, so that's a success. Let's check the other channel and see how it does. Okay, we're gonna turn the volume on this channel all the way down, and we'll switch channels. Okay, so there's our input into that channel coming into that first tube here we are coming out of the first tube okay still looking real good right there um, it goes immediately into a cathode follower on this channel on the second stage so I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and Check. It. We'll check it coming out of the um, gain control after that. So that should be right there, I think. Oh, def got some kind of noise or something going on there. Oh, there we go. Oh, you see it going to oscillation? Look at that. See that? That's some some kind of oscillation or something is taking place right there. Or maybe it's just my probe. Okay. Nah, looks like it maybe it was just my probe. Okay, so we're looking good right there. Let's come out of the um Let's go all the way to the end of this channel we'll, so we'll come to this point right here and see what we get all right now whoop I can hear just a bunch of noise. Something's going on and it's not good. Something's going on and it's not good. Whatever it is. What's coming into there? Okay. Bunch of noise. Alright, so something's not right. Something's going on. Um. I did determine okay so we've got good signal right there that's that's coming out of the gain control so we're we seem to be okay there for the most part but there is a lot of noise or something going on in that channel I don't know if we maybe we have a bad tube on this channel but something is certainly not right Okay, so anyway, after that tone, after the tone stack, it'll go into can I get something right there? Ooh, bunch of noise. Bunch of noise. Look at that. This is going to be just nothing but noise right there. Look at that. Okay, so I'm losing signal or something somewhere along the line over here. All right, we'll see if we have anything coming out of that stage. Uh, so it should spring out of that stage right here. Boom, and it should be much bigger. And it looks like we got nothing but noise. Hmm, that should be a 12AU7 in that stage. 
Maybe it's not seated in there, right? Is the tube even lit? Yeah, it's lit. I don't see it doing anything except producing noise. So I think we got a bad 12AU7 on that second in that uh, V6 position. So let's change that and see what happens. Okay, I changed that tube out to a new tube and we'll see what this does. Uh, it looks well, possibly better. Um, maybe not. <laughs> Look at that. It looks like... Uh, it looks like Arabic lettering or something. <laughs> that's what we're getting out of that right now. Well, that's obviously not right. Something's not right. Is that a probe issue or is that a... What's going on with that? Okay, so here's what's going into that, that tube stage. Ooh, that's not good either, is it? Okay, so what's going into that is not good either. Let's go back a little further. So we're looking good right there. That's going into the cath the cathode follower stage. Coming out of the cathode follower, there's what we have on one side, and on the other we have what garbage? Yeah, on the other side it looks like garbage. Okay. All right, so I think I've got some direction on what's going on. So on uh, the cathode follower, let me show you what uh, we're doing here. So we modeled this part of the amp after uh, sort of like a basement, more or less. Yeah, so after one stage of gain, we go directly into a cathode follower, which pushes through the tone stack. Let's look at this one these at a time so okay so that's what we've got on the wiper of the bass control looking good wiper of the mid control looks good wiper of the treble control looks crazy look at that what's going on with that have we got a bad capacitor right there maybe Okay, so that's what we have on one side of a, this uh, little capacitor. On the other side, it looks like that. I think our mid-range pot is bad on this channel, possibly. Because look, just when I touch the mid-range pot, there, I'm just basically, I'm barely tweaking this mid-range pot and look at it. Look at the noise that's being generated. Here, you'll be able to see it more if I... See, look at that. I'm just barely touching that mid-range pot. And look at what's happening to it. So I think... I think that's possibly where our signal is getting... muddled up right there. Watch this. Okay, so this is me sweeping through the treble range. There's treble all the way down. There's treble all the way up, but you can see it. Look at all the, look at the distortion in this wave. It's like these little nodes appear on it. Some kind of parasitic oscillations going on here for sure. And that, that mid-range pot seems like it might be the root cause possibly. Yeah, that looks te that's terrible looking. Yeah, we've got major trouble with that that stage. At least I've narrowed it down to what's which stage is the culprit on this channel. Okay, so like I said, I think we had multiple problems with this thing. Uh, one of which was this mid-range pot, which was a 10k pot. 
Um, I've taken the back off of it. This is an Allen and Bradley. These are really nice pots, so this thing should be capable of being fixed. Uh, but when you take it apart here, you can see it actually is in pretty good shape. It, I've sprayed it already, and you can see it uh, way different than the CTS pots that we're used to seeing in a lot of vintage equipment. CTS was probably the main supplier for guitar-related stuff. Um, you see a lot of Clarastat pots as well. Uh, Stackpole, you see their pots quite a lot. It's a little bit less common to see Allen and Bradley stuff simply because it was a lot more expensive, I think, back in the day. And it's a really well-made pot. It's, it's hard to believe that there would be anything irreparably wrong with it. I've sprayed it a couple times and uh, spun it around and it seems to be seems to be okay. I'm going to give it a little spray of lubricant here also. Now, I think what I want to do is plug it back into the circuit, see if it behaves any better. The pot's reinstalled. It's jumping around when I, as I sweep through the range here on the mid-range pot. Uh, it goes from, well, that's, that's the treble. It goes from that all the way up. And I turn it down, it goes to nothing at one point in the sweep. Then it goes to a huge signal, and then uh, very soon after that, gets cut probably, what, in half? And then goes down a little bit more on its way back down to the bottom of that range. But something is certainly not right with that. I mean, that's... See that? Something's not right in the tone stack if it's doing that. Okay, so this thing just keeps keeps getting stupider and stupider. I uh, have gone round and round with this, and I've been pulling my hair out for hours now. Honestly, it's just been this has been total fucking nightmare of an amp. This one really has. <clears throat> um, the worst part is. You know, I felt like I'd done everything right in the construction. The stuff that I could control, at least, you know. I mean, a lot of this stuff had already been done before me, but I'm getting some weird stuff going on. There's some kind of oscillation or something that's taking place because it will come and go, and it, it kind of click, 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 it gets these noises. It's like a surge of voltage or something. There it is. You hear that? That tick, 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 tick. You can see it on the scope as well. Tick, tick. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know what the hell that is. Now the tremolo doesn't work. When I plug a guitar in, it worked fine with the uh, signal generator, or it seemed to be working with the signal generator. Seemed to be at least, but now it's not working at all. Don't know what's up with that. And then I've got this, now I've got this tick 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 problem to deal with. I think it might have something to do with the power supply. Um, I, I did my best to, uh, you know, to lay everything out properly on the power supply, to decouple, you know, stages um, properly and all that, but I might want to go back through and just maybe try something different because I've got basically two different channels with two completely different amps in two different areas of the same amp. <sighs> okay. Man, I think back to the drawing board with this. 
Okay, here it is. It just basically started up on its own. So something is feet. I think I might have an idea what it might be. Let me let me check on it because. Uh, I noticed that I'm getting some whoosh whoosh on my master volume here, so it has to be feeding back from the following stage. I think that's exactly where it's coming from. It's coming from the 6C4. I think I need a cap there. So I have no cap uh, on the input of that 6C4 right there. I think I probably should put a cap right here. Okay, so it looks like that fixed the problem. That little capacitor right there fix the problem uh, that is a capacitor that um, is blocking DC coming off of the phase inverter back into the master volumes and I had forgotten to install that uh, but it's in there now and it uh, has definitely done the trick as far as that oscillation is concerned um, and I have not tested this side yet I've tested this side and it fixed the problem I was having over here it's not popping and oscillating so I'm suspecting that it it may have solved this problem on on this preamp over here as well but uh, we'll see I've got to put some tubes back in because I was pulling tubes earlier so I've got a couple of these tubes out on this side uh, this isn't the quietest amp though I I, I don't know if there's gonna be a way for me to really um, quiet it down beyond what it already is I mean it's it is what it is I'm not gonna tear this thing apart again so um, this might be as good as it gets I will look I will investigate whether or not there might be a ground loop situation and maybe I'll move some grounds around but other than that um, you know there's not a lot I can do about that especially when you've got you know you've got grounding starting at two ends and then ending back over here on this end you know what I mean so you've got it's this is just not the greatest design that's why you usually don't have amps that start with an input on one end of the chassis and another input on the other end of the chassis you want the inputs to be on the same end even if you have multiple channels because you want all your grounds and your and your flow the whole scheme needs to move from one side to another uh, but this one it's it's you see what you see what I mean this is just it's kind of crazy and this might be the best it gets okay so this is pretty funny right here so look at what happened to my probe just a few minutes ago broke the tip off the probe I'm not sure what the hell happened with that I noticed that the probe was uh, getting really kind of iffy for a while now it's been kind of iffy you know I'll put my probe on something and it kind of takes a second or two to get you probably seen some videos where it's been a bit frustrating to watch me try to probe with this thing well finally broke it but uh, a fellow sent me a set of probes the other day I shit you not uh, they literally arrived yesterday <laughs> the, the day before I broke my probe and I was wondering I was like I was like, he sent me some probes. I was like, well, my probe works okay. I was like, it's not a huge deal, and yada yada. Well, obviously, that was before I broke the thing, and serendipitously, he had just sent me these. So thank you, uh, Nima Wando. I appreciate that, man. You know who you are. Uh, he also, these came with it, and I'll show you some other things he uh, sent as well. And uh, we'll probably do a video uh, with some uh, viewer mail. Here pretty soon I'll show you the rest of what he sent but I had to open this because I knew he already told me in an email that he was gonna send me some probes so I knew that they were sitting there from yesterday and it's just a pure coincidence that <laughs> he happened to send these and I absolutely needed it just now so awesome <clears throat> okay so we've gotten well into the testing phase here and uh, I've, I'm testing the tremolo at the moment, I've got a switch hooked up here to the uh, foot switch switch. Uh, without it, it will not come on. You need you have to have a foot switch for the tremolo to work. Uh, you could put a panel switch on that, uh, but I don't want to. He didn't want to drill any extra holes, and I don't have any 
uh, pots with the switch on the back of it uh, at the moment. So I would have to order that. Uh, not going to do that. We're just going to make it where it's foot switchable. If he wants to turn it on, he can do something like this. You know, put a switch on a plug or he can simply plug a foot switch into it. Um, it does work. Here it is without. Here it is with. Turn the depth all the way down. And you could conceivably just leave the depth all the way down and it, it you would not even notice it was on. It's not very noticeable. Uh, maybe if you listen really closely you could notice it, but it's you could probably just leave that all the way down and it would be fine. Um, the rate seems okay. So that's the slowest. Here's the fastest. The rate seems really good. It's got a good sweep on that rate, I think. Uh, that's probably good enough. The depth, I think I'm going to modify the depth somewhat. Let me kill everything. I'll show you what I think I want to do. So, although they're very similar in design, I did not end up using a, a Supro uh, as the model for the trim. I used a, a Vibrolux. We should be able to adjust the depth in a couple of different ways here. Um, I could adjust the bias of this tube and I could bypass it with a larger capacitor. That would probably help some. Um, I think I could also adjust this 220K resistor if I wanted to. The pot is backwards anyway, so I have to rewire it where the, the red is on, the red wire is on the other side. I have to swap the two outside leads. No big deal, I'm, I'll get back in there and do that in a second because I wired that backwards. But I think uh, what I want to do for sure is up this value. And let's see. I think I'll start right there. Basically up, up that value, I might take the 3300 out and maybe play with that and see if we can't get a little bit more, um, squeeze a little bit more depth out of it by upping this, this drive tube. Uh, we'll up the output of that and hopefully that will give us a wider swing. That's going to increase the depth. Um, the channel that we're checking right now is the Fender style channel. Uh, I had designs on modeling this after a hot rotted baseman. So what I was going to do, this was my idea and this is what I had going at first. So I was going to use the base channel of a baseman, uh, 6G6. Uh, that is one of the early 60s um, basemen. This has one, two, three, four stages, four triodes in this channel um, before it gets to the, the output here. The thing is, the thing we have to remember is we have more gain on this overall than than this amp because we have two gain stages after the phase inverter, the cathodine phase inverter that we wired into this. So what I was going to do, you see this has a cathode follower in it. I like the idea of a cathode follower. So we had a gain stage directly into a cathode follower that pushes signal through the tone stack. Uh, I modified this cathode follower a little bit earlier on because I was getting some oscillations and I thought maybe it was coming from the cathode follower. So I did add a resistor on the input right here as a snubber. Uh, also added another resistor down here. I think it was 5K that I put here and a 1K down here coming out of that in, uh, in series with the, the signal. Um, 
so that's not notated on here yet. I'm, I'll probably try to draw a schematic a little bit later on, but uh, suffice it to say, I eliminated this last gain stage from the mix. So what I've done here instead, so I've come out, uh, there's a gain control here into another amplifier stage and then into a master volume and then it skips from there and it goes on to the 6C4 now instead of having this fourth stage. Um, I'll, I'm going to eliminate it. So I've got stuff wired in there at the moment, but I'm going to get rid of that on this second stage, the second half of this tube. I'll have basically a, that won't be in, it used for anything. That's gotten us updated. Uh, I, need, I still need to wire in. I've ex been experimenting with the uh, negative feedback control a little bit. I think I know what values I want to put on the negative feedback control. So I still need to do that. And I still need to um, wire in an adjustable bias pot for the output tubes. And we're almost there. We are getting real close now. Okay, guys. Finally, at long last, I am done with this thing, I believe. Uh, the only thing I have left to do now at this point, I'm going to add a universal uh, volume control on this. Um, it's probably going to be kind of like a post-phase inverter uh, master volume. Uh, and that's only because I have a space on the front panel that I was going to put some kind of... Uh, some kind of presence control and uh, really couldn't find what I deemed an appropriate circuit for that given what I have here in this amp. Um, because of the cathode ion phase inverter, it wasn't really going to work out the way that I had hoped. So I'm going to, th I think, do a universal uh, master volume. That's going to allow me to crank the channels independently to the level that I want to crank them and then have a an overall output master volume. Uh, you could see what all has been done in this amp. I mean, compare this to what <laughs> we had at first, and it is absolutely no comparison. There is, uh, it's a complete 180. I mean, over here in the power section, um, you know, you could see where I've added the CL70s. I've got a couple of those added. That's going to slow down the inrush current when you uh, first turn the amp on. The Leads have all been cleaned up. Everything's been, you know, just really tidied up in large part. Added a bias, uh, adjustable bias over here for the output tubes. I don't like the fact that it's really so close to the input of the amp. I would have preferred to have it somewhere else, but that's really the best and only real spot that I could fit it in on this amp unless I wanted to... I suppose I could have moved it down, maybe downstream over here somewhere, but I would have had to run some longer leads. I, I, it just made more sense to put it up here near where the existing diode and everything already was. So unfortunate that's so close to the input, but I don't think it's going to add any noise or anything like that really overall. So we're good there. High tension fuse, as you guys saw earlier, me uh, put that in. Uh, you know, added... Um, Added another capacitor node just to smooth things out a little bit more going into the, the first stages of these amplifiers. You know, this has got kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid between uh, terminal strips and um, kind of true point to point on some of these areas. You know, we've got point to point going on uh, a few of the uh, sockets and so forth up on the panel. We got some point-to-point -point wired stuff uh, Just a completely different amp. You could see all of the uh, twisting that I did again on the On the filament wires just the whole thing is is a 180 degree Different amp than what we started with uh, also went ahead and drew out a Schematic for at least the preamp. I'm not going to do the whole thing the power is fairly standard, but I did at least, and, and also the tremolo, if you want to know what the tremolo was, just follow a uh, tremolux. Here is the uh, preamp section. You can see we have the two channels. Uh, with this channel being, this is actually channel two. I, I mislabeled these at first, but this one's channel two up here. This is the uh, baseman style or uh, fender style channel. 
And, um, you know, I did some reworking on this as I kind of went through. Um, you know, of course, we've got the first stage. Uh, and then immediately we have this um, cathode follower right after that. Well, I adjusted the cathode follower. I did some modifications on this to uh, hopefully add some clipping to this cathode follower stage. I added this uh, 1 meg series resistor here, uh, 10K resistor here with a uh, little diode uh, to prevent some arcing here. Um, this little 1K to help stabilize the whole thing so it doesn't oscillate. Uh, just really a step up over what you would normally find in a cathode follower stage on most vintage amps, even Marshalls and stuff didn't didn't have uh, this kind of stuff. They didn't really go much into that clipping and stuff early on. Then of course into the tone stack right there, you can see that's pretty similar to what you would find on the normal channel of a basement uh, tone stack. Uh, looks like I might have forgotten to ground that right there. I'll, I'll go back in. I guess I could do that now, can't I? give us a chance to look at my uh, my 51A reproduction fountain pen here. So we'll just take this to ground. All right, there, good enough. All right, uh, this next stage I was going to end up with because I had too much gain and it was oscillating and doing a lot of weird funky shit. So I decided, uh, okay, I can't do this. There's too much gain trying to cascade those two. Uh, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to run those in parallel. And a lot of times when you see parallel um, stages like this, you will see them on the first stage. And I believe that's even what they had in the beginning on this amp uh, but what I've done here is I've moved the parallel down to here so we have a gain stage we have a cathode follower uh, with the clipping pushing through a tone stack which is kind of a basementish tone stack into this stage which is in parallel both sides um, and that's going to give us again you know a maximum amount of clipping through these stages so uh, what I think we've got here is a really, really nice sounding uh, guitar amplifier overall. Then this 6C4 right here that we added, this this triode, um, goes to uh, a pair of tubes or a pair of triodes that then drive the output. So we've actually got uh, gain stages after the phase inverter, which is interesting and kind of different. In, in most amps, you don't see that. Um, Channel 1 is just your basic kind of uh, Marshall JCM 800-ish or JMP style channel. Uh, minimal mods on this from just a basic uh, straightforward clone of a Marshall. Um, unlike this channel, which is a lot of just different things that I was kind of experimenting with up here to get that one right, first of all, and to get it to sound good. Did more experimenting up here on Channel 2 than I did on channel one but uh, there's still a few few values you'll notice in there that are a little bit different uh, these one meg values right here they had 470 K's in these positions I changed those to one megs um, and there is the tube layout now as it currently exists again we got that 6C4 uh, the tremolo let's see uh, was moved at one point to V3. I think it. I think at first it was V5. If I'm not mistaken, no, it was split between two different tubes. Um, so that's different, obviously. But there is what that looks like now. So that is the schematic for the preamps on this. So there that is. If I ever have to. Uh, look at this amp again for any reason I will know what I did you know I don't memorize all this stuff and you have to have notes when you've looked at hundreds of amps I mean this stuff all tends to start running together so you know it's not like I memorize all of this stuff so uh, it helps to have notes it helps to have schematics 
and uh, in the future if I ever have to look at it again I'll, I'll be able to refer to that but yeah I, we are at the point now I'm gonna add, go ahead and add that universal master volume control on the front panel and then we will be able to get to a demo hopefully today Check this out. Okay, so on the Marshall side over here, uh, I can crank. Now, nothing's plugged into either one of these channels. There's nothing coming in. I have it hooked up to the uh, desk speaker here, so you should be able to hear uh, what's going on, uh, what's coming out. So I'm going to crank up the Marshall side, the gain and the volume. So there's the level of noise when it's fully cranked. I mean, it's, it's all the way up. I also have a universal volume control that's all the way up. Uh, that's a post-phase inverter master volume. So there's that side. That's what that sounds like. Now I'm going to crank up this other side. Listen to this. You hear all the low end hum right there, that 60 cycle hum. That's being introduced into this circuit because we have everything over here so close to the power and because of the way the ground bus is run, everything kind of local to the sockets, which it, which normally would be the V1 socket. This would normally be V1 for this amplifier that starts over here on this side. That would be the V1 tube. And it's running away from the power supply. Normally, you would have it starting on this end as far away from the power supply as you could get it uh, and then uh, the ground bus, basically everything grounded to a bus that ends up at the jack. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I haven't always been great about grounding. Grounding is, is one of those things that just boggles my freaking mind. You know, you see so many different designs, you see so many different ground schemes. Some of them work, some of them don't. And, you know, after a while, it kind of gets confusing as to some of the principles you should use. Uh, when grounding stuff. There are some things though, there's some ways of grounding that uh, are pretty proven and uh, the way that this is currently grounded as an amplifier with this being the main amp is about as quiet as it's gonna get for something with, a, with as much gain as this side has. And I, I tested this thing, I play tested it, and it sounds freaking phenomenal. This is a rocking amplifier. The only problem I'm having right now is the noise that's being introduced on this side in particular, and it has to do with uh, the way that this is grounded. So you've got the grounding for the V1 tube is going to the exact same node on the bus where the reservoir cap is being grounded so it's it's ass backwards from what you would really want you would want that to be grounded down here so you're gonna have to have two different ground buses one for the main amp over here for channel one I'm gonna have to probably install a second ground bus in this I don't know how I'm gonna do it all the components have been put on these terminal strips with regard to where the ground bus is terminated. For instance, we've got a ground point coming to right here where all the stuff that's local to this area is being grounded. The problem is that's right downstream. That's very close to where the reservoir is being ground, uh, introduced into the bus, which should be at the end of the stream but in this case, it's near the beginning. So it's setting up a ground loop. It's introducing this noise from the power supply, directly injecting it into this these first stages. And, you know, this is one of those things that's just like the design of the amp is so really unnecessary and kind of horrendous in a way. Because, I mean, really what you would want is you would want these controls. I mean, and look at the, look at on the front of this amplifier. If you look at the amplifier, 
there's so much room on the panel. You know, why wouldn't you have two rows, you know, like a, I hate to say it, but like a, a mesa or something, you know, where you have rows of uh, different channels stacked on top of one another. In, in this case, it's starting from opposite ends of the chassis. You're just setting yourself up for these kinds of problems, especially when we come in and try to modify it for more gain. Where noise is paramount, you, you have to keep the noise down at each stage. So what I'm going to have to do is, I'm not even really sure, to be honest. I may have to take everything off of these terminals over here that I possibly can and completely rethink the ground scheme for this channel if I'm going to make this work. This little ground bus right here, I already had these uh, tacked on to the backs of these um, pots, which is really a no-no. I shouldn't have done that in the first place. I should have known better. My fault on that one. But I've lifted those off in an attempt to stop that. Did the same thing down here. I was getting more noise over here and uh, lifted those and that's cured it over here. Which, I again, I should have seen that coming, but it's just one of those things. It was a habit of doing that. That's kind of the way I have done it a couple times in the past and really in this instance is entirely inappropriate the way that this bus is originating at this end um, and being grounded being grounded over here at this input which is fine if again if this is the only channel in the amp that's perfectly fine the problem is we got this other channel over here with all of this noise i mean i've resolved something here okay i will never again i don't think i will ever again take in anything like this without quoting what i think it's worth because this amp, after I'm done with it, with the two channels and having one side be a... I mean, this thing sounds massive and awesome. Um, both channels sound great. I just got to eliminate the noise in that one channel. And this thing is going to be absolutely monstrous. It's going to be the best sounding Gibson Titan that the world's ever seen. However, you know, all the time that I've spent doing this is more like a labor of love than it has been any kind of money-making venture, I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, I will never again take anything like this. I'm gonna completely rethink the way that I do business when it comes to this kind of stuff because it's just not conducive to a money-making venture. You know, I'm not gonna go into exactly what I charge this fella to do this, and, and it's not his fault, it's, it was my quote I gave him a quote range, thinking that it's just going to be uh, changing some caps and maybe, you know, uh, cleaning some pots and things like that. That's the kind of quote I gave gave the dude. But it turns out this thing, this thing needed much, much more. The wiring was so atrocious. It was so, so bad. And there were so many opportunities to improve the amp. It's just hard not to take to do that. If I take in anything else like this, I'm going to set an upper limit budget on the thing and be like, okay, this is minimum what it's going to cost you for me to take this in and make it right, uh, just stem to stern, make it the best amp it can possibly be with mods included, all the stuff included, parts, whatever. That's got to change. And this ground scheme has certainly got to change because it is awful as it stands.